Galia Madut, and welcome everyone to Fields of the Future. My name is Riyaz Zanani, and I will be moderating today's Fields of the Future speaker series, Exploring Cybersecurity. A little bit about me professionally, I work as lead corporate counsel at CarMax headquarters in Richmond, Virginia. I am a board member of AKAB for the Northeast, and I'm also a Fields of the Future team member. The Fields of the Future speaker series is hosted by the Aga Khan Education Board with the aim of exploring career paths, innovation, and opportunities in selected fields of the future. As for today's edition, we will be begin by reflecting on knowledge society and the purpose of education in Islam. At this time, I'd like to invite Leila Rajan, our Fields of the Future team member, to share this reflection. Ya Ali Madad, everyone. And thank you, Riaz, for the introduction. Welcome to the fourth episode of Fields of the Future series. My name is Lala Rajan, and I serve as the team member for the Fields of the Future of the Aga Khan Education Board for the United States. Before we begin the event, I would like to refresh the Jamaat's memory about Knowledge Society and the purpose of education in Islam. Aga Khan highlights the purpose of continued learning at Aga Khan Academy, Mozambique, on June 25, 2004, in which he said, in the Islamic tradition, they viewed the discovery of knowledge as a way to understand, so as to serve better God's creation, to apply knowledge and reason to build society and shape human aspirations. How does understanding the purpose of knowledge discovery help us understand knowledge society? It tells us what the two critical attributes are of true knowledge society leaders. First, to discover new knowledge, which is related to the first purpose of understanding God's creation. And the second is to share and apply new knowledge, which is related to the second purpose of God's creation. Hazramam at the Aga Khan University Convocation Address on 6 December 2006 explains that these attributes will be of the utmost importance in the future, and I quote, all of these changes suggest that we are moving into a new epic of history, a new condition of human life. Many observers describe this new, new world as the knowledge society, contrasting it with the industrial societies or the agriculture societies of the past. In this new era, the predominant source of influence will stem from information, intelligence, and insight, rather than physical power or natural resources. This knowledge society will confront people everywhere with new challenges and new opportunities. Now, some of us might be wondering, does this purpose and this attributes match what the rest of the world thinks about knowledge society? According to the definition outline, by the United Nations. Knowledge society have capabilities to identify, produce, process, transform, and use information to build and apply knowledge for human development. This definition matches exactly what our beloved prophets and Imam has thought for centuries. What underwrites the ability to contribute to the knowledge society? Hazramam has said at Kyrgyz Republic, and I quote, there is no better investment that individuals, parents, and the nation can make than an investment in education of the highest possible quality, unquote. Education of the highest possible quality can benefit us in so many ways. It allows us to acquire the newest knowledge. It provides students with the competitive advantage within global societies. It prepares us for leadership in the knowledge society. It provides the fundamental skills that will allow us to participate in fields of the future and to transition between careers. Therefore, I would like to encourage the students of our Jamaat to aim for education of the highest possible quality as there is no better investment plan education. Lastly, I would like to thank the students and the Jamaat who have attended the series. This event would not have been successful without your participation and support. I would also like to take this opportunity 
to thank the team and partners for all their hard work in organizing these events. Now, I would like to hand it off to Riaz to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Thank you so much, Leila, that was beautifully said. Now that we have an introductory understanding of some of the relevant concepts, let's meet our speaker for today. Jamil Jaffer is the Senior Vice President for Strategy, Partnerships, and Corporate Development at IronNet Cybersecurity, a technology product startup founded by General Keith B. Alexander, the former Director of National Security Agency and founding commander of U.S. Cyber Command. At IronNet, Jamal, Jamal, sorry, Jamil leads all of the company's strategic and technology partnership efforts, including developing go-to mar go market and technology integration plans with some of the largest cloud platforms and cybersecurity companies in the market, evaluating potential acquisition targets and developing overall corporate strategy and thought leadership around collective security and collaborative defense in the cyber arena. Jamil is also the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute and an assistant professor of law at the and director of the National Security Law and Policy Program at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Prior to Jamil's current positions, Jamil served on Capitol Hill in a variety of roles, including on the leadership team of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as the senior staff member of the House Intelligence Committee. Jamil also previously served in the Bush administration in a number of positions, including on the leadership team of the Justice Department's National Security Division and in the White House as an associate counsel to President George W. Bush. Now, before we begin, I'd like to encourage our audience to ask questions throughout the session. You can do so by using the Q&A feature of Zoom and enter your questions there. The upvote feature will be enabled, so if you have the same question as someone else, please like it and it will rise to the top of the Q&A box. Our team will be noting the questions to be asked during the Q&A session towards the end. Now, I'd like to mention that this recording, uh, this session will be recorded and along with the presentation will be shared on our website, fieldsofthefuture.com. Now, with further ado, our speaker Jamil, ja let's meet our speaker Jamil Jaffer, who will speak to us about his career path, new opportunities within his field and how this field will evolve in the future. With that, I'd like to hand it off to Jamil. Rios, thanks so much uh, for having me. And uh, thanks to Shanel and Layla and the whole team uh, at the AK, at the Agacan Education Board uh, for hosting us for this event. Um, so my name is Jamil Jaffer, uh, as Rios mentioned. Um, and I'm going to talk to you guys today about cybersecurity. So I'm going to share my screen. I've got a presentation for you all. I'm hoping, by the way, that this will be an interactive session. So um, I'm going to go through a, a series of slides. Uh, but hopefully within 20, 25 minutes, we'll um, jump right into questions. Um, and Rios will help us get through that. So. With that, um, you should hopefully see my screen. Um, all right, so fields of the future, cybersecurity. Uh, we're gonna, here's the plan for today. We're going to uh, do an introduction. We're gonna talk about what is cybersecurity. We're gonna talk about the industry itself, the job market. We're gonna talk about, a little bit about my journey um, in this space. Uh, we'll talk about some of the key cyber skill sets uh, that you need to succeed in this arena. And then how do you get there from where you are today, whether you're a, a, a working professional, a college student, uh, or a high school student, or a parent, frankly, um, how do you get yourself or your uh, your student uh, to that to that place you want them to get to? And then we'll share some information on how to get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. Uh, you'll have my cell phone number, my email address. Uh, feel free to reach out. Um, always, for me, text is better, but I'll mention that again at the end. Uh, but always easiest to reach out to me by text, and I'll always, always get back to you. All right, so next slide. All right, so who am I? Uh, so as Shano mentioned, uh, as Riaz mentioned, I'm sorry, uh, I run strategy partnerships and corporate development at Ironet Cybersecurity, and I also run a think tank uh, for, on nights and weekends at the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Anson Scalia Law School. So what is, what is cybersecurity? When we talk about cybersecurity, what does that mean, right? Fundamentally, what it means is it means protecting against digital attacks, right? Efforts by uh, individuals, uh, criminal actor gangs, uh, hacktivists, people who have a political agenda and are doing it online, uh, nation states, right? Russia, Iran, North Korea, uh, and, and the like, uh, China uh, might be engaged in attacks on other nation states. And the United States also uh, has a cyber offensive and defensive capability uh, and might engage in similar activities against uh, those who oppose us around the globe. So when you're thinking about cybersecurity, you should think about, okay, what is it that's being protected? Who is being protected? Is it an individual? Is it a company? Is it a government agency? Uh, is it a nonprofit, right? Who is conducting the attack, right? What is an attack? Is it, is it simply theft of information? Is that a hack? Is it, what's the difference between a hack and an attack? 
Is it destructive? Is it designed to uh, obtain money? Is it designed to obtain intellectual property? Um, why is it happening, right? What are they doing this for, right? What is the goal of the attacker? Um, and how might I address their goal uh, such that I can keep them out and deter them from doing it again? And then perhaps most importantly, how are they doing it? How do they get in, right? What is their plan now that they're inside my systems, my networks, right? What are they going to do? How are they going to escalate their ability to get into my system and access my information? And then what are, going to do, what are they going to do with that information when they leave? Are they going to just steal it? Are they going to utilize it for themselves? Are they going to publish it on the internet? Are they going to try and take some sort of uh, action against my systems that make it harder for me to work? Do they want money, right? Um, and how are they accomplishing those things? Okay, one thing you need to know, so we're right at the outset, since this is a session talking about the fields of the future, the unemployment rate in cybersecurity is 0%. Let me repeat that. There is not a single person who is looking for a cybersecurity job today that can't potentially get one because there are more jobs than there are individuals looking for them. And in fact, the unemployment rate for cybersecurity has been at zero for the past decade. So for 10 years, there have been more cybersecurity jobs than people looking for them. So there's a lot of opportunity here in this space uh, to come into this environment and succeed. All right, why, why is cybersecurity so hot right now? Why is it so important right now? Well, if you think about it, right, our online lives are fundamentally exploding, right? If you think about the quantity of global traffic on the internet, right? It's gonna reach 4.8 zettabytes by next year. Now, no, probably nobody knows, or only a handful of people in the audience know what a zettabyte is. I had to look it up, right? But suffice it to say that it is three times the amount of traffic next year than there was five years ago. And the amount of traffic in a single year next year on the internet will be more than the total internet traffic ever through four years ago, right? So a massive amount of traffic. 5.3 billion users on the internet by 2023, two years from now. And by next year, 29.3 billion wireless devices. That's three wireless devices per person globally if you average it out across the country. And if you just think about your own home, right? You think about uh, those, those home, audio, home, home, uh, home devices. I won't mention any names, otherwise they'll, they'll start talking to me. Um, but the one that starts with an A, the one that starts with an S, right? There's a lot of these uh, home, home devices, right? You have your iPhone, you have your Android device, you have your watch. You, I mean, you might, have a, you might have a dozen devices, not to mention your computers, your laptops. And so all of these things are connected to the global uh, internet. At the same time, data is becoming more critical, right? There's been a massive increase in the quantity, the speed, and the criticality, the importance of the information transiting the internet. And if you think about it, particularly in the post-COVID environment, uh, where, uh, where a lot of people are working from home, all the data that used to be trans transiting just corporate networks is now going across the global internet, uh, whether, it's, whether it's through a, through an encrypted methodology or not, it's going across the global internet to those corporate networks. And over the last few years alone, in the last decade, we've seen over 7 billion identities stolen. You might say to yourself, well, there's only you know, 7, 8 billion people around the world. How is that possible? Of course, everybody has multiple identities online, multiple email addresses and the like, multiple logins, right? We've also seen massive intellectual property theft, right? Out of the United States alone, we see billions of dollars a year stolen in intellectual property, trillions total. That is to say, there are nation states that are taking American intellectual property for our private sector companies and using them to build economies overseas. Right? And cybersecurity itself is a challenge, right? As all of these things are happening, as the IP traffic, internet traffic goes up, right? As it becomes more important, the information becomes more important, cybersecurity attackers are getting better, right? They're taking minutes or less to compromise the system and to completely own it, to have complete privileges over it takes just single digit days. The problem is that victims typically take about 56 days to discover that they're breached, much less to push somebody out of their network. So if you think about it, if it takes minutes or less to get in and single digit days to own a system, if it's taking victims you know, over almost two months to discover the people, and by the way, that's a dramatic increase over just two, three years ago, right? That tells you how important cybersecurity analysts, data scientists, and people who work in this field are to protecting uh, those systems and networks. So let's talk about some of the attacks that have happened that we've seen recently, right? So back in 2015, we saw an attack on the Sony Pictures corporate network. It was North Korean state actors. Um, and they were doing it because there was a movie that was being released uh, that offended the North Korean leader. Well, what did they do when they got in, right? They stole about 11,000 files. They exposed a whole series of emails. They leaked four movies, including that movie uh, that, that they didn't like. It makes you wonder, why would you want to leak a movie that was, uh, that was uh, contrary to the North Korean leader's interest? Uh, you know, it's sort of an odd move, but they did it. Uh, 47,000 social security numbers stolen. And perhaps most importantly, people don't remember this about the Sony Pictures hack, is they deployed a wiper virus that essentially bricked the computers. It made the computers inoperable. They weren't able to reboot up or the like. 
about $35 million in cost of Sony Pictures as a, as a, as a, as a cause of that attack by North Korea on Sony Pictures uh, in, at the Colum old Columbia Pictures Studio uh, there that you see on the left there in Culver City, California. Right, 2016, we saw an attack on the Las Vegas Sands corporate network. Here we had Iranian state hackers, right? And they were there because the CEO, Sheldon Adelson, who's now passed away, his speech had offended the Supreme Leader in Iran. And they got in actually through a casino in Pennsylvania. Uh, they conducted a brute force password attack. That means they just banged on the door until they could get in. They then hopped over to Las Vegas because a systems administrator used the same password in Pennsylvania that he did in, in, in Las Vegas. They engaged in a live interactive attack. They were actually on the on Las Vegas Sands systems in real time. They pulled data out, including data about what rooms people had stayed in, who they were staying with, how much money they had on credit with the casino. They didn't get into gaming systems, uh, but they were able to get in and steal some very important information, right? In this case, what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. It ended up in Iran, right? And they also deployed a malware bomb where they overwrite and rebooted the computers, causing them again, also to be bricked, again, a destructive attack, making the computers at the Las Vegas Sands Corporation inoperable. And then perhaps one of the most interesting ones, right? In 2017, Russian state hackers attacked the Ukrainian government. And their goal was part of a larger effort to destabilize Ukraine. Uh, they went after the National Bank of Ukraine they like, and they used a what looked like a piece of ransomware, but was actually a, vi a wiper virus, just like the one deployed in Sony Pictures and against Las Vegas Sands Corporation. But what's interesting about this attack is this attack got out beyond Ukraine. It got out beyond the intended target. And remember, this is a sophisticated attacker, the Russians, right? And yet their virus got out and it caused $10 billion in damage worldwide. The single largest, most, most, most costly hack in the history of the, of the world, right? Six non-Ukrainian companies, including Maersk Shipping Lines, the one on the left there, lost, cost them over $250 million a piece, right? Merck, the US drug company was another one and a variety of European companies. Maersk was so badly hit that in fact, they lost containers for up to three months and their, their ports were closed for up to two weeks and they were only able to reconstitute their systems quickly because they found a server that had been taken offline in Africa uh, due to a power outage and the, the hard drives there were still, were still valid. They hadn't been wiped out and they were able to re-image their entire global network from those, uh, those computer systems that were offline in Africa. Other than that, they would have been down for much longer. So if you think about it, the massive scale of these attacks, and this wasn't even the intent. These were, this was collateral damage to Maersk and Merck and all these European companies. They weren't even the targets as the Ukrainian government was. So if you think about it, obviously we've seen what a, what a dramatic impact cybersecurity attacks and, and cyber threats can have on industry and governments. Well, if you look at the growth rate in, cyber secu in the cybersecurity industry, right, it's pretty significant. Between 2017, 2026, just a little under a decade, right, a nearly 100% growth rate right, uh, total over the year. On average, about 8.4% growth a year in this industry. And you can see since 2012 to 2026, it is a steady increase upwards and upwards. So um, there's this, that means there's a real opportunity in here uh, for folks who wanna get involved. And you look at what the industry itself looks like, right? Cyber engineers are most, amongst the highest paid and most recruited IT individuals. 0% employment we talked about since 2011, right? Pay packages for chief information security officers at the top of the cybersecurity heap are over a million dollars a piece, right? And you think about it, just look at the open ed count this year alone, right? The number of jobs that are unfilled in cybersecurity would fill 50 NFL stadiums. I say it again, the unfilled jobs in cybersecurity would fill 50 NFL stadiums. Uh, increasingly, you're seeing more women in cybersecurity. It was 11% of the industry was was women in 2011 and 2013. By 2019, it was up to 20%, and that's a growing number by significant margins, right? And worldwide, it's not just in the United States, worldwide, there are 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs. And these cybersecurity jobs in the United States are in some of the biggest states, some of the biggest states actually where there are Somali populations, California, Texas, Georgia, uh, Illinois, Virginia. Uh, there are significant Florida, there are huge amounts of jobs in all of those states as well as largely across the, across the entire United States, as you can see here. I'll tell you a little bit about my journey in cybersecurity, because it is a little bit of an odd one. As you heard from Riaz, uh, I'm not your typical uh, cyber executive. I, uh, I'm a lawyer by trade. I went to UCLA for college, uh, where my dad raised me on uh, both computers and politics. Uh, I decided to pursue a little bit of both. Uh, right out of college at UCLA, I worked on a campaign and then worked on Capitol Hill uh, for a congressman from Virginia. Um, I then went to law school at the University of Chicago. Uh, and so I am a practicing lawyer. Or I have been a practicing lawyer in my history. I guess I'm a recovering lawyer now. Um, I've worked for federal judges, uh, both in Houston, 
uh, in Denver, Colorado, as well as Washington, D.C. Um, as Riyadh said, I worked at the Justice Department of the White House. And when I was at those jobs at the Justice Department of the White House, I did have a chance to use uh, my background. I had actually paid my way through college at UCLA, um, even though I was a poli-sci econ major. I paid my way through college doing computer support. I did uh, computer support for the Life Sciences Department and Athletics Department at UCLA. Um, and I ran, I ran networking cable. I cl climbed up in ceilings and ran networking cable to pay for college. Um, so I was able to use that cybersecurity knowledge and skills, or, that, or at least that cyber knowledge and skills, that technical knowledge and skills, um, to end up working on surveillance matters at the Justice Department. I worked on all the, all the programs revealed by Edward Snowden, all those technical surveillance programs, worked on almost all of those. Um, and also had a chance to work on the President's Comprehensive cyber, National Cybersecurity Initiative that President Bush rolled out at the end of his administration. I then went back to the law firm um, and worked there for a little while. I worked on Capitol Hill. I went back to Capitol Hill at the House Intelligence Committee, where I helped write the first major cybersecurity information sharing bill uh, out of the House Intelligence Committee that got enacted into law in 2015. And then after working at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for a little while doing non-cyber stuff, I had a chance to come to IronNet. And I've been here at IronNet for six years, which for me is the, is, the, is the longest job I've ever had by three times. Prior to this job, my longest job I'd ever had was two and a half years. Um, and most of them were one, one and a half years. So being at IronNet for this long has been, has been an amazing experience. And I've had a chance to do some really great things. Uh, but what's really cool about this is, well, I guess what, what I'm trying to demonstrate with this story is you can do all sorts of different things and end up doing something that you're really interested in. As long as you sort of pull that thread through and you try and get good jobs, you're working for interesting people, you're working for people who let you succeed, um, and you work hard at those jobs and try to excel and make your bosses look good, you too can get into the field and the space you wanna be in. So some of the fastest uh, cyber, cybersecurity skills growing out there, if you're just thinking about what, what you should do if you wanna get into cybersecurity, obviously a uh, development of applications, we all have iPhones um, and Android devices and the like, and so, you probably have dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of applications, right? To secure those applications is important. So that's one of the fastest growing skill sets in this, in this area. Cloud security, obviously with the move to uh, the cloud environment, particularly with the deployment of 5G, uh, fifth generation cellular networks. Uh, there's a lot more in that space. So you can see some of these other jobs here, including threat intelligence, incident response and the like. So there's a lot of jobs um, in this field and even specialized jobs like health information security are growing at a pretty big clip, 20% uh, over five years. So this is another way to look at that same data, right? And you look at the average salaries here. And see so if you look at it, right, um, the top jobs, the top 10 jobs in cybersecurity all pay on average close to $100,000. And if you look down at the, at the bottom at number eight, chief information officer, we talked about how chief information security officers, which is actually a sort of subcategory of CIOs uh, or a related category, while they make on average $103,000 in this, in this uh, uh, display, we saw that the top CISOs and, and every one of the Fortune 500 will have a CISO by, by this year, they make over a million dollars a piece. So if you think about it, the growth potential, even these salaries is significant and the upper potential is significant. But what's even more interesting is even though the chief information security officer is the top information officer at a company, right? You see application security officers on average make almost 30% almost more uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, so here's the pyramid. Here's who, here's who you can be, where you can get at the entry level. You can come in as an entry level engineer, an intern, a junior associate, right? A pen tester, that's somebody who goes in and tries to hack into systems, right? You can then move up to be an analyst, uh, an engineer, uh, a, you know, a, a cybersecurity technician, data security analyst, and keep moving up the chain until you make a chief information security officer. So this is sort of the pyramid of jobs uh, that are here in this space. And if you look at what other things you might do, if you're, if you're already in the field or you're wanting to get into the field, you're thinking, okay, what certificates should I be looking to get, right? How might I get into this? If you look here at the top, you see uh, where, there's, where there's people who are, the number of jobs available, right, is on the bottom, right? And on the top is how many people hold certification. So CompTIA, right, which is a security certification, there are more certificate holders than there are jobs. But if you go down towards the bottom, you see things like CISSP, the Certified Information System Security Professional. There, there's 90,000 people who have the certificate. And today, 120,000, 118,000 openings. Same thing with CISA, 36,000 secured certificate holders, 63,000 jobs. So if you're looking for what certificates to get, this is a particularly good metric to look at. Now, how do I get there from here, right? Whether you're in high school or in college or you're, or you're a, a professional who's looking to make a switch, right? You might look, if you're younger, you might look to have degrees that matter, right? So computer science, engineering, there are cybersecurity degrees now, data science, business operations. And I guess I'm proof that political science, law or policy studies can get you there also, although admittedly through a little bit of a, of a winding track, right? It also matters, right? Where you go to school, going to a top-notch institution certainly helps. Doing well at that institution, or if you're a professional, 
in your current job helps. And the fact of the matter is that you can in fact do it, right? If I can go from being a, you know, a, a poli-sci econ major at UCLA um, and just, you know, doing computer support and helping users in the life sciences or athletics computer lab, right? And end up making it to be the executive of a, of a, of a, of a significant cybersecurity startup uh, run by a former founding commander of US Cyber Command, you too can do it no matter where you are in your career or, or in high school or in college, you can do it. And parents, your children can do it. So if they're interested in this field, allow them to pursue it, let them go forward, let them pursue the thing they care about. All right, and perhaps most importantly, you have to be willing to take risks. I'm not saying take any risk, right? Take smart risks. For our parents, a high school diploma was the minimum thing you needed. For our generation, it's at least a college degree and probably a graduate degree, right? But beyond that, once you have that top-notch educational uh, and, and capability, it's the thing that, that as Hazi Rahman has said before, nobody can take away from you that education, right? You've gotta be willing to take risks. You've gotta take jobs that don't seem obvious. You've gotta be willing to go out there and put yourself out there. You gotta work hard for sure, right? And you've gotta, you gotta be luck, you gotta have a little bit of luck and get bosses that, that will let you excel. But if you don't take risks, you won't succeed. And the fact of the matter is, you know, a lot of people are scared of taking risks, right? They think to themselves, boy, you know, I went out and spent all this time getting a great degree and, and going to graduate school or whatever it is. Now's the time to take that, that safe job, make some good money, put a nest egg away for my family. But the fact of the matter is that if you look back at your career or your life or your education, chances are most of the people in this room have done pretty well all along the way. And for those of you that have struggled, and I bet you a lot of you also struggled at times, right? The fact of the matter is that if you're here right now, you probably picked yourself up for that struggle, dust yourself off and gotten better. If that's true, or even a little bit of that is true for you, that means you're the kind of person for whom going towards risk is a win. You will succeed at it. You, where everybody else turns around and runs away, if you run towards it, right? Again, taking smart, smart, intelligent risks, right? You will succeed and you too can do it. All right, so that's a little bit about sort of cybersecurity, a little bit about me. Um, please uh, drop me a line. We can talk in person, as I said earlier. Texting me is best. Uh, you've got a website there you can, you can hit me up at. I'm on Twitter. Please follow me if you'd like to. You can find me on LinkedIn also, and you can also reach me at, the, at my George Mason email address. But again, I can't emphasize this enough. Text is most important. And let me just be candid. If for whatever reason you don't hear back from you within 24 to 48 hours, text me again. I don't mind. Harassment and bugging me works. I don't, it doesn't bother me. I talk to all sorts of people all the time about jobs and careers. So I, I'd love to do it and love to be engaged with you. So please reach out. All right, so Riaz, back over to you for some questions. Awesome, Jamil. Thank you so much for sharing your field of the future with us today. Um, that was a real treat and uh, we're really excited to get into Q&A. So with that being said, um, we're gonna open the floor up to questions. I mentioned earlier to use the Q&A feature on Zoom, um, use the upvote feature. There's a like button. If you see a question that you wanna hear uh, get answered, that's gonna rise to the top. We've got a large audience, so there's a lot of questions coming in. So if you want yours to get seen, um, you know, use, use the features properly. All right. Jamil, thank you so much. So let's let's get started here. We've got a we've got a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they're asking, you know, if you're not into programming, you know, what kind of jobs are available in the cybersecurity field? Yeah, there's I mean, there's tons of jobs, right? So uh, if you look at the company that I work at alone, right, we have about call it 300 employees, right? About 150, 160 of those are engineers, right? The re and coders and data scientists and the like, right? So first of all, if you don't want to write code, you can still be a, a, a engineer, you can still be a data scientist, right? You can do hardware work, right? But even if you don't want to get into a technical field, right? We have, we have an entire sales team, right? We have operations folks. We have lawyers like Riaz and me, or, or some recovering lawyer, right? We have, we have strategy folks. Uh, we have folks that drive the business. We have marketing people. So you can get into cybersecurity and have a variety of careers in the space. You don't need to be a coder, a data scientist, or an engineer. Although I will say the pay, at least according to that, according to the schedule we saw, tends to be pretty good for those folks. So if you're into that, that's great. But look, I mean, look, I'm proof that you don't have to be an engineer. I have no engineering skill sets whatsoever. I might be able to program basic and that's about it. Um, and so, uh, so there's, no, uh, there's no worries there if you're, if you're not an engineer or a coder. Awesome, so we've got, obviously, you know, we've got some middle schoolers, some high schoolers, some, some yeah. let's talk to some of the young folks really quickly. So some of them are asking, you know, what can they do in high school or what kind of courses should they focus on if they wanted to get into cybersecurity? Yeah, look, I mean, I don't think that there's necessarily any courses. I mean, obviously, if you can, if you're doing well in math, in math and the sciences, right, the hard sciences, chemistry, physics, uh, and the like, 
then you have a skill set that you can apply when you get to college, right? So I wouldn't worry so much about particular courses uh, to take other than if you can take the highest level advanced placement or, or international baccalaureate classes, right? Succeed at those, do well at those, right? There's no need to take those classes and, and, and not succeed, right? You want to take those classes where you're, where you're capable and where you're going to do well at them so you can get into the best school you can get into and then follow the field you want to follow. But here's the thing I want to emphasize. I want to emphasize this both for the high schoolers, but also for the parents, which is in your career, you've got to follow something you really care about, that you're passionate about. You can't go down the road of simply going to be a lawyer, doctor, banker, because that's what your parents want you to do, right? Or because what you think is the highest paying job. That is not the right approach. You will succeed most effectively if you find a career where you are passionate about it, right? I'm passionate about cybersecurity. That sounds weird to say, right? Because I went and was a lawyer for a long time. I'm passionate about the law too, right? But I care about this thing. I think it's an important area and you will succeed if you follow something that you really care about. Now, a lot of parents are gonna say, well, what, what if my kid wants to be an artist or something? You know what? There are opportunities in that space too. That is okay. I'm guessing that on this call, if you're joining them for Fields of Future and Cybersecurity, you're probably not thinking about being an artist, but if you want to be an artist, that's okay. Parents, you should let your kids follow their path, right? It doesn't mean, you know, again, you know, drop out of high school, drop out of college, right? As I said earlier, uh, the mom has made clear over and over again that an education and a top-notch education is critical. It's the one thing besides your faith that can't be taken away from you, okay? But you still got to do something you believe in and love. Don't go be a lawyer, Dr. Banker, because mom and dad says you got to do it. And mom and dad, don't tell your kids that. Oh, absolutely. So let, let's talk to the college students really quick. So we'll take that next step up. So, you know, yeah. some of them are asking about internships in the summer, um, you know, sure. sophomore year, junior year, and some of those more critical, you know, pre-professional world um, years. Uh, what, what should they be focusing on? What, what's some internships yeah. or, or courses that they should be taking? Yeah. So look, I mean, I, I, we saw all those, all those degrees that are potentially uh, important or interesting, right? Computer science, engineering, uh, uh, there are cybersecurity degrees now, um, and, and I don't know how good they are, right? They may vary from institution to institution. Computer science and engineering are always safe ones, right? Uh, but again, I'm, I'm proof that you don't have to be an engineer to get into this space. That being said, if you can do internships or demonstrate a skill set or work in the technology field, that's a great thing to do. If you look around, there are a lot of Ismailis in technology, right? There's a lot of Ismailis in cybersecurity, right? You can get those interests, reach out to them, get a mentor, right? And more importantly, actually, don't just get a mentor, get a sponsor. I didn't know what the difference between a mentor and a sponsor was until just literally three weeks ago. Somebody explained this to me, a guy that I work with, Gary Evie. Uh, he used to, who was a long time at, at, at IBM. He explained to me that a mentor is somebody who gives you advice throughout your career. They're the ones who guide you and give you uh, their thoughts and, 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 and sort of explain to you where you should go. A sponsor is somebody who does all of that and then takes you that next job, helps you get that job after the, after the one you're currently in, and the job out of college and that internship, right? You want to identify both mentors and sponsors, people who actually get you opportunities. Um, and let me tell you, IronNet, IronNet hires, you know, 20, 20 summer interns every summer, right? Why shouldn't one or two of them be a smiley, right? I don't know. Haven't gotten any applications, but let me know, right? NSI, the think tank that I run, right, has has fellows. We have we have a technology fellows program. There's there isn't a smile in that program, but he didn't get in because he reached out to me. He got in because he applied through the process and he was at the top of the pile, right? Again, you're not going to jump the line here because you know somebody known as Smiley, but it certainly doesn't hurt to identify people you know, that your family knows, that are related to you in some way, that are that share a, a religious background or a cultural background. Those things can only help, right? Everybody else does it. There's no reason you shouldn't too. Doesn't mean you have to be successful and academically successful and have the, the skill sets. But if you do, knowing the right people and helping you your resume in front of the right people instead of just in a pile on Indeed or Monster.com is a huge benefit. Absolutely, expanding your network is so critical um, in every field. Um, so let, let's talk to some of the professionals now. So we're getting, we're getting a very popular question here. Have you had the opportunity to look into cyber risk in the era of quantum computers? And if so, how far are we from, the, from that era? Yeah, you know, the, uh, it's funny. We've been talking about quantum for a long time. Uh, quantum computing seems to always be 10 years away, right? We're always talking about how we're almost there, but we're not quite there. I actually think quantum computing is in play now. We know that, for example, uh, IBM just sent its first uh, quantum computing device to the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, that's being rolled out. We know that quantum computing uh, capabilities are being made available on the cloud through IBM and other companies. Um, AWS, I think, has a quantum computing capability they're making available to folks now. So it's happening, right? The reality is that quantum computing is here. It's not here in a industrial or practical sense yet. And it may be a while before we get to that, but quantum computing is real. Um, and that has significant impacts for cybersecurity because 
quantum computers can break our standard encryption that we currently have today, right? At the same time though, quantum computing does give you the ability to distribute encryption keys in a way that's, that's novel. And so it's not clear what impact quantum will have on encryption and cybersecurity, but what you, what you, what you should know is that if you're interested in a, in a developing, expanding, very innovative field, quantum computing is one of them, as is machine learning, artificial intelligence, all those things. Those are exploding fields also, uh, and definitely an area to get into. And there are security aspects of both of those. Um, and I know we've had sessions actually, I think on AI uh, recently, or will in the future. Awesome, and speaking of that expansion, um, th there was the slide with the bar chart. Can you talk a little bit more about the internal growth rate versus the ex external growth rate um, on the chart that you had earlier? Yeah, that was, that was, yeah, that was internal growth within a given company, right? How much they expect to spend more, and how much they expect to spend outside of their company. So are they, pardon me, are they going to hire um, or spend money internally to the company and hire analysts, right? What and the like, or are they going to go out and spend it externally and buy software, uh, buy external capabilities? That was the difference. It was internal and external. Okay, we've got a lot of audience members who who would like to know a little bit about you. Um, you know, what was the favorite job that you worked at, uh, and did you enjoy working at Capitol Hill? Man, um, yeah, I loved working on Capitol Hill. That was a lot of fun. But I describe working on Capitol Hill um, versus the executive branch in sort of the following way, right? If you think about sort of a, a somebody in the military, right, who's who's engaged in a in an activity, right? They're they're firing a gun at, at a target, right? If you're in the executive branch, you might not be the guy pulling the trigger, right, or the woman pulling the trigger, but you and you may be the lawyer writing a memo about whether they can or can't pull the trigger. You might be writing the policies or the like, right? So that's but you're at least on the side of the person who's who's sort of the, the war fighter, the person deployed out front, the cyber defender in the corporate world, right? If you're if you're on Capitol Hill, it's more it's a little further removed, right? you're sort of setting the rules and you're watching this person pull the trigger, the cyber defender do their activity. And you're saying, you know, I really don't like how you did that. I really prefer if you pointed the gun a little bit that way, or you defended in this manner. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write you a really strongly worded letter, right? Uh, that you should do this. I'm gonna call your bosses up and make you do this thing. And if you don't do it, I might change the rules about, that you operate in, right? To make you pull the trigger in a certain way or make you turn the gun that way or make you defend in this manner, right? So. Capitol Hill is really interesting, a great place. It was my first job out of college besides the campaign that I worked on. Um, and I love going back. And I, I, I was back for a long time, for a total of four years, which again, as I said, for me is a really long time in two different jobs. Um, but I really love being in the executive branch, right? Being on the side of the folks who are actually doing the really hard work. And I love my time um, at the Justice Department working on really like critical national security issues. We were doing surveillance of Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups. We were surveilling foreign governments, right? and really identifying what they were doing and how they're trying to come up against the United States and being involved in, in, in collecting that information and helping the government obtain that information was just an amazing experience. And I got to combine my sort of cyber knowledge and my technical skills about how surveillance is done uh, with my law background and, and my ability to sort of help, help get things done for the government. So, um, so if you're interested in what Edward Snowden did working in the government in any capacity, whether it's at the National Security Agency um, or the CIA, um, there are a lot of amazing jobs uh, in that space uh, for men, women, and for young people. There are internships at all these agencies. That's awesome. So another thing that a lot of people are wondering is your current job. You know, what's an average day look like for you? What do you do? And like, what are some of the goals at your job? Yeah, no. So it depends on which job, right? Because I have two, at least two jobs, maybe three. Um, so don't tell any of my bosses. They all, they all sort of know, right? But nobody's really thrilled about it, right? Everyone, my my co-CEO at Ironet refers to my job at, at George Mason as my side hustle, right? Uh, but of course, I don't have the heart to tell him that all of his board members, save one or two of them, are all on my board at NSI too. So it's it's gonna be fine. Um, but um, so average day uh, looks like um, I'm working on, so right now, Ironet recently announced that we're uh, gonna be going public through a, uh, through a uh, what's called a SPAC, right? It's this new hot thing in, uh, in the markets. Um, so I've been involved in our efforts uh, in that regard. Um, I've been looking at companies, I've been talking to companies that we might acquire, right? Um, uh, technologies that we might need. Um, I talked to our sales team about uh, capabilities that they need and talking to our, our technology builders about how to build that capability, right? What does the customer need, right? It's like, I don't know if you've ever seen Office Space, but the guy who's like, I'm the guy between the customer, right? Or the sales team and the technical guys, right? That oft oftentimes tends to be me because I do our partnerships. Um, uh, and so um, what else do I do on an average day? Um, I talked to some of our biggest partners, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Splunk, CrowdStrike, um, I talked about getting us access to their technology so we can build a build an integration with them. I talked to the go-to-market team about how to sell together with them, right? Sell with and sell through those those uh, those companies. So that's the average day at Ironet, right? Then I've got sort of the the nights and weekends at NSI at the think tank where we're constantly talking to members of Congress, their staffs, uh, people in the executive branch about uh, issues like uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, uh, uh, cybersecurity actually comes up a lot. Um, 
uh, whether we should change the, uh, the current uh, uh, authorization for the use of military force against Al Qaeda and how we might modify it, right? And working with our staff, I've got a staff of six at, at George Mason that do that. Um, and they help get uh, meetings with members of Congress, their staffs. And so we're doing a lot of that. We're doing a lot of events with our fellows. And we have a blog called The Skiff, uh, theskiff.com, which you can check out. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, you know, writing op-eds and TV and all that sort of stuff. So it's a lot going on, right? Not a lot of sleeping happening in this household, unfortunately. I love the office space reference. I was going to say, what, what, what would you say you do here, uh, Jamil? Say, um, right, exactly. exactly. Um, so we, we got a question that just came in. I, that they're seeing a lot of chatter around identity and access management um, yeah. and identity being the new perimeter. Is this area an area that's exploding with new opportunities? Yeah, certainly um, identity and access management is critical, right? If you think about uh, the fact that um, these Russian hackers were able to get into uh, the SolarWinds Corporation um, and exploit their update cycle, right? Uh, you guys heard about this big hack that happened in December. They were able to get into this company, infect essentially the code that they were sending to their customers, right? Uh, they first tested it for a little while and they ultimately put a, put a piece of malware in there. They then put it out there. Then these systems came back and said, hey, we're alive. And then they started to use a small handful of them to go in and, and, and steal data. But what's interesting about that is they used, they exploited credentials and the like to get in and they exploited vulnerabilities in the identity space, right? What is identity, by the way, identity access management? It's, it's when you use your, your, your user ID and your password, right? Think about there's a variety of ways to, to harden that, right? You might use a second factor, right? Or you're, you might have them text you to your phone like we often do for our banks, right? You might have a, uh, a, a, a number that you enter in from your phone um, that you get in a text message or, 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 an, or an app on your phone. Um, but there's a lot more beyond that to identity access management and making sure that people have the right access to the right things, but not everything, right? Um, and so that is a growing field in the cybersecurity arena. And, it, and there are people who say identity is a new perimeter. There are also people who say, look, you know, password list is the thing. We've got to have a zero trust environment. You got to assume that your environment is exploited, right? How do you control it if it's exploited? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do have a lot of Jamaki members that might be, you know, in that later stage of life, maybe they're looking for a career change, yeah. you know, um, and so we want, we kind of want to cater and speak to them a little bit. So if you're, sure. let's say you're uh, someone who just doesn't have a degree, are there any diplomas or certificate programs that you would recommend yeah. to get into cybersecurity? Yeah, certainly. Look, some of, some of the most successful people I know uh, in this space are people who've changed their careers and changed into uh, the cybersecurity field. It's certainly doable. Um, there's a lot of certifications that we saw on that last slide uh, that demonstrate what uh, what you can do and where there's a gap between people who have this certification and how many jobs there are. And so there's a lot of opportunities like the CISSP uh, that you might pursue. Um, you also might think about going back to school, right? Um, investing in yourself, right? Investing in an education is never a bad thing, right? It may be expensive, right? But if you think about the interest rates on student loans, right? They're they're one, two, three percent. They're they're a tiny amount compared to what you might pay on a mortgage or the like, right? Um, and it's, a, it's an investment that, as Hazar Mom has repeatedly said, pays off dividends in the future. And that's true, not just when you're young, but when you're older, right? There's nothing wrong with going back to school as an adult. In fact, Hazar Mom talks about being a lifelong learner, right? That's part of what he means, right? Now, again, it doesn't mean just go get a degree just for, for no reason. I mean, if you have a passion, right, or an interest and you think you can be successful, that's another thing to do. Um, and then finally, right, I think it all comes back down to taking risks. Right, you've got to be willing to believe you can do it. Right, again, not taking crazy risks, not taking un unwarranted risks, but taking smart, intelligent risks is the way to get ahead. It's the way to switch careers. You're never going to have an opportunity unless you sort of push yourself off the ledge. Right, you got to be willing to do that and know that you will be okay. You'll you'll succeed. You'll do fine. You'll ultimately, even if you fall down the first time, you'll pick yourself up and get better and excel at results. We talked about certifications, diplomas. Well, how about software? Um, you know, some, some of the yeah. Jamaican members are asking what kind of software would be helpful for them to know to get into cybersecurity? Look, I mean, obviously all the, all the key coding languages, Java is, 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 uh, is a common, JavaScript is a common coding language, right? Understanding data science, understanding uh, the new uh, uh, coding languages and languages that are being used around artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? And the new capabilities in that space, that's a growing area. Um, you know, uh, people, um, People talk about um, having a, a deeper uh, skill set in other languages. I don't think you need that, right? I think that if you take the languages that are currently in play, uh, as long as you feel like you can get there, look, learning a programming language like, is like learning a foreign language, right? You've got to, it's hard work, right? If there's nothing like doing it day in and day out. And I'll be honest with you, I am not as disciplined as I'd like to be. And so for me, part of the discipline of doing some of these things re requires me to pay money to, to somebody else to do it, right? So when I spend money because, you know, I'm cheap, um, it, it forces me to like actually go and do those things, right? So I try, I sign up for all these free classes online on edX and all these places. And they're great. They're all these, they're MIT courses on edX and they're free. 
but I never do them because I haven't paid money. But if I, I bet you if I spent a hundred dollars on it, I'd be in that class every day, right? And by the way, the yeah, IPN, the education board offer a lot of free classes, right? I actually sat through and, and took and, and paid for a small amount relative to what it actually cost. Um, the Scrum Master courses that, that uh, AKB offered uh, when IPN offered, um, and that was awesome, right? I'm not a Scrum Master, I'm never gonna be a Scrum Master, but I've lost Scrum Masters that work in my organization. So I wanted to learn how they think about it and how they work with project managers to get their job done. So I sat through two days or through four days of online learning, uh, pay, you know, essentially at, at I think maybe a, a 20th of the cost that would have cost you if I got and bought it out, out on my own. But again, they're even paying that $150 or whatever it was made me sit through those, those four days. So, you know, if you're like me and you're cheap and maybe a little undisciplined, pay the money, take the course, it'll force you to do the work. Oh, I love this. Um, you know, there's a lot of these questions that are all self-help. Uh, and, you know, we got another one. Are there any yeah. resources that you recommend? So there's magazines, journals, certifications, podcasts, books. Is, is there anything that would be a go-to resource if someone's interested in cybersecurity uh, that wanted to learn more about it? Yeah, um, I've got a lot of, uh, well, there are a lot of interesting resources out there. So one, um, if you look at my link, if you look at my LinkedIn, you'll see I, re I repost or my, or my Twitter, I repost a, a lot of, a lot of podcasts, a lot of interesting articles. Um, so check those out. Um, but my friend Ron Eddings uh, runs a podcast uh, with uh, Chris Casaldo. Uh, they've got a great cybersecurity podcast that I highly recommend. You can find it on LinkedIn. If you look at some of my, re pardon me, my reposts on LinkedIn, you'll see Chris and Ron's, uh, Ron's thing. You can also get their bios on nationalsecurity.gmu.edu and then link to their podcast from there. Uh, we have a great podcast at NSI for international security called Fault Lines, where we have two Democrats and two Republicans argue about national security issues. Turns out there's actually not as much arguing as you think. It's actually a lot more sort of, we see the world a lot more similar than you might think. Um, uh, my wife runs a podcast called Amazing Women of the Intelligence Community uh, with the, the Amazing Women of the Intelligence Community a group called Iron Butterfly, named after the first female CIA case officer. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, Lawfare runs a great podcast if you're interested in, in law and politics and national security. Um, if you're if you're more on the liberal side of things, uh, there's Pod Save America, which is very popular. Um, uh, there is, uh, what else is, what else is good out there? Oh, if you're into cybersecurity, uh, there's a great podcast by Stuart Baker called, um, uh, the cybersecurity law podcast. Um, uh, he's out of Steptoe and Johnson. So you can find him either on NSI's website or on uh, Steptoe's website. Um, what else? Those are a few. Um, and there's a ton of online resources, right? edX is a great platform um, uh, as is Khan Academy uh, for finding free courses that you can take advantage of. I'm currently signed up for an MIT financial accounting course. I haven't taken any of the classes yet. Again, I didn't pay for it, so I need to get more disciplined. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities like that. And look at what IPN offers. I mean, I've, I've seen an amazing number of opportunities there. I haven't signed up for a lot of them, but I did take that Scrum Master course and it was awesome. Um, and it was four days of intensity. I'll be, I'll be honest, it was, not, it was not a cakewalk. There was a lot of work, um, but totally worth it. That's awesome. I know you mentioned your, your Twitter, your LinkedIn. Um, you know, people are still asking for your contact info. We put it yeah. up earlier. So I just yeah. want to mention to everybody that we're going to bring it up again and put it up on the screen. Um, yeah, let me see if I can. Uh, here yeah, we go. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, there we're, it is. we're going to put that up there just so so that everyone can uh, see that. And we're going to we're going to leave it up at the end. And again, everybody, this is going to this is going to, this is recording. Uh, and so we will be posting it on fields of the future dot com. Uh, That's right. We'll, and you can go there and you can go just you know, for sort of pause on this frame and then you'll yeah. have all the information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, you know, we've still got some time for questions. Uh, you know, I, as long as you still have time, Jamil, we're, yeah. we're going to keep Let's rolling through these. Uh, you know, we've got some really good it. questions coming in. So uh, one of our uh, attendees is asking about your thoughts on application security and some of the opportunities in that field. Yeah, look, I mean, obviously, um, you know, uh, we all have hundreds of apps on our phones. And, you know, it's hard to know whether these applications are secure. In the Apple environment, at least, you know, it's a closed sort of universe. And so they do a little bit of vetting. In the Android environment, it's open season. I mean, there, the number of apps on uh, on the on the Android platform that have exploits built into them, right, is massive. And some of them are, are innocuous. They're just, you know, adware. They're collecting your data, right, which, by the way, not necessarily innocuous. Uh, but um, but some are really destructive and problematic. And so, you know, it is uh, it is important uh, that applications be secure and be seen as secure, right, because it's going to uh, hurt the application environment if they're not seen as secure. And so. Uh, it's why you saw 164% growth rate by, in the five-year window uh, in that field, because I think app developers and companies that have apps and that use apps, whether it's a large company that has a way of accessing their, their platform through an app like Citibank or Bank of America, right? Um, or a company that's built just around an app like Uber, right? Um, uh, you know, or, or that's a hybrid like CarMax, which uses both an app and has, has physical presence. Um, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of important uh, security issues to consider when you roll that app out, and even as you update it and upgrade it, uh, as we saw with the Solar Winds fiasco, that wasn't an app specifically, but again, the update cycles can be problematic. 
So can you walk us through, let's say a company gets cyber attacked, um, yeah. you know, what happens next? What, you know, what are the steps that, that occur? Um, and then to build onto that, um, you know, how do you see the future of forensics due to cyber attacks? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing that happens when a cyber attack happens is everyone's trying to figure out, okay, what happened? How did it begin? What's, what's been stolen or what's been hacked, right? How deep is the problem? The next phone call, Riaz, as you know, is to the lawyers, right? The callers are like, what do we do, right? Are we going to be sued, right? How do, we, how do we protect the company, right? How do we protect the shareholders? You know, how do we not get indicted, right? Um, or, or, or fined by, by a regulator, right? So the lawyers are involved. And what that allows is that provides sort of the protection of the attorney-client privilege. And then they'll bring in an incident response team, right? Uh, oftentimes a big company, a FireEye, Mandiant, uh, you know, Rapid7, right? A company that has some cybersecurity defensive skills um, and, and, and threat hunting skills. And they'll go in and look at what happened to you. They'll do forensics. They'll identify what, what took place. They'll identify steps you could take now to stop the staunch the bleeding as well as to improve your security going forward. And then you'll roll in some technology probably and maybe some people, right? A company like an IronNet, you know, or, uh, you know, or a CrowdStrike or uh, whatever it might be, uh, applications and software and hardware uh, to defend your network and better protect it. Um, and then maybe your CISO will get fired and they'll be replaced. Um, who knows? It depends on how bad it is. But, you know, actually, by the way, it turns out that a lot of times people don't get fired when they're cybersecurity, major cybersecurity breaches, because at this point, it's so clear to everybody that the attackers have, a, have, have, the, have the advantage, right, that you don't blame your defenders as much, right? Now, that's problematic because, you know, we're one major attack, one attack on a power grid or the like, um, you know, before we start being really worried as a nation. Um, and we ought to get ahead of that. We know the threat is there. Uh, by by uh, by nation states and others, um, we should be working together better as 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 companies, right, and as individuals, uh, and as and with the government and industry, because uh, the government can't do it alone, industry can't do it alone, um, and yet we're not working together particularly effectively. So a lot more needs to be done there. There's a lot of policy, by the way, and law in that space too. So don't think if you're if just because you're not an engineer or or the like that you can't do work in this space. You can and 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 should. We'll take a little bit of a step back here uh, when it comes to uh, going back to everyone's roots with their education. There's, you know, there's still a lot of questions coming in. You know, sure. how many years of experience? Um, there's one question about coding experience. How many years of yeah. coding experience do you need to, to get into cybersecurity? So can you talk just a little bit more about, yeah. um, you know, entry level or uh, experience that comes into play with, with some of these jobs? Yeah, no, look, I mean, you can get a entry level job right out of college with, with no, with sort of, you know, if you have an engineering degree or a computer science degree, there are so many jobs currently available in cybersecurity, you don't have to have prior experience. Now, to get a more senior job, obviously, you need a certain level of experience to get that more senior job. But to get entry level, there are a lot of entry level jobs in this field that you can get into right out of college with a degree and right out of an advanced degree and right out of a career transition. There are enough jobs available if you're willing to take a pay cut if you're coming out of a transition job right and be innovative there's no reason you can't get a job in this space um, if you've taken some classes done some certifications and the like uh, there's there's again there's more jobs than there are people uh, as noted by that by that decade-long zero percent unemployment rate how about high school so so no college experience if you just have a high school diploma um... yeah look i mean it, it's certainly possible uh, but I, as as i said earlier right you have to be realistic about the fact that as for our parents, a high school education was a necessity and a college degree was a luxury. For us, it is almost the case where a college degree is a necessity today, particularly in high growth fields like this, right? It's gonna be, if you're an amazing coder, an amazing programmer and you start your own company or you go and you just crush it as a high school intern, right? At the NSA or at a company, then yeah, perhaps you can get a job, right? But the reality is that 99% of jobs are gonna be hired in internships and out of colleges and out of graduate schools, not out of high school. Um, and again, I can't emphasize this enough, right? In education is something that nobody can take away from you, right? If the, the, the best time to get an education is early on, right? Is to get through it, right? Get that first degree. I also, by the way, and this is important, I think for both the parents and the students, I don't think, and the different people have different views on this, but I don't think going straight through from college to graduate school is wise. I think it's critical that people take a couple of years off and figure out what graduate school they want to do, why they want to do it, and then go back more committed. I saw, at least in my experience in law school, and I've seen you know, decades of lawyers, right? Over two decades, almost two decades of lawyers, where those who go straight through consistently do not as well as those who take time off, have a little bit of work experience, and go back committed to it, and go to law school for the, for the right reasons. And I've seen that, by the way, in technical fields also. So parents, I know, I had it happen with my parents, you know, push your kids to go straight through, finish up all your education, in my mind, it is better to take time off, 
get the get the right graduate education, the one that fits. And by the way, don't worry, your kids won't go back to graduate school because as I said, right, you know, for you all, right, high school education was necessary. The, that college degree was important, right? Same thing for us. Your kids know that. They know they need to get a graduate education. They will, when the time is right, give them the time and space to do that. Well said, Jamil. I, I have to agree there. I took a similar path. Um, so definitely echo that sentiment. Um, you know, we have some parents that are kind of interested for their for their children, their little ones. You know, there's the, there's a question here that you know, son is six years old, uh, doing coding on like uh, what is it, code.org. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, they completed the basic level. Should they continue going through that path? Is that something that matters? Um, should they or should they stop it uh, and just let you know let them kind of get into whatever they're getting into and then kind of revisit um, these things later on? You know, it's funny, um, uh, it's actually a little bit of both, right? Uh, which is to say, if they've got a skill and they're excited by it, and they're interested in it, there's no reason not to sort of stoke that and press that, right? Um, and give them opportunities. The, a lot of times, the code.org, for example, is great because it's gamified, right? It's actually, it's actually sort of, they see it as a game, but they're learning a skill set, right? And so that's a really neat opportunity. You can't force it on kids, right? What you want to make it an opportunity where, where if they're interested, they'll take advantage of it, right? I'll tell you just today in my own house, you can't see it, but around me is, all sorts of uh, all sorts of screwdrivers and the like, uh, and we've got a couple of drones here because we were working on stuff. Because my son, we bought them for him before, and he he dug up one of his boxes. Right, we're having a no tech Sunday, right? So actually, this hour that I'm spending with you guys today is our only technology that we're using today. Uh, this is an idea that my wife and I had when we, we went to a visit to Israel, uh, maybe about three or four years ago, and we were with an we were with an Orthodox Jewish community that we went with uh, on this trip, and an Orthodox rabbi, and on Sunday. They spent no, they, they use, I'm sorry, on Saturday, Friday to Saturday, right? They use no technology, right? No cars, no nothing. So we walked around everywhere. We engaged these conversations, right? It was so weird. I said, oh, you know, we talked to each other and walked places more than we've done ever before. And so we decided to implement that at home. And so from Fridays uh, in the evening to Sundays in the evening, we generally don't use technology, right? And so that means no, no ALEXA, right? No laptops, no iPhones. So again, this is the only, time, only thing I'm doing today. But what that ends up having us do is, you know, we end up working on projects, right? We end up playing, playing, you know, uh, like board games. It's the weirdest thing, right? We had this puzzle game that we played. So one, I highly recommend that. But two, if your kids are into it, you know, press that interest, right? Um, and, but they will also return to it. If, you, if your son's six years old and doing code.org, which is awesome, right? I, even if they leave it for a little while, they'll come back to it, right? Because you'll see, they're like, I want to do some Minecraft mods. Great, put them in code.org, have to do some Minecraft mods, right? There's no reason they can't game and code at the same time. Um, and that can be a really successful thing. But by the way, don't try to turn your kids into computer scientists at age six, right? Just let them do what they're interested in, right? It'll, it'll, it'll come out, right? It'll come out. And it, again, by the way, kids will do whatever you're into. So if you're into that, right, you can get them interested in it too, right? I recently, we bought, we bought, I talked about these drones, right? I bought a drone because I wanted the drone, right? My son loves it, but I, bought I wanted to play with it, right? And now we're learning about how, how it works and the, and the sort of aerodynamics of it, which is super cool. I love that. I'm going to have to implement no tech, no tech Sundays or something. It's awesome. Uh, it is yeah. hard. It is really hard, right? Because you're like, you want to pick your phone. You, you're like, you know, and I, like you want to call people and be like, hey, I, or you want to use the, by the way, using maps. I can't use Google Maps to drive it on the weekends. I literally have got to figure out where to go. My wife is like, are you, are you crazy? I'm like, no, we just got to figure out. We'll just drive till we get there. We literally did this. We were, go we were going on a hike. I didn't know where we were going. We just sort of found our way. We asked directions. Who has directions anymore, right? But you got, if you're going to do it, you got to be serious about it. We lock, we typically lock these devices away. It's awesome. It is, just try it. It is the hardest thing you'll probably do, but it's amazing. Love it. Um, so, you know, people are wondering, how do you manage all of this? Like, it sounds like you, you know, you have so, so much on your plate. How do you do all of this? I don't know if it's like coffee or what it, what, whatever it might be. I don't know how many gallons of coffee you must drink. But all, it sounds yeah. like you have a lot on your plate. How do you manage all of this? Um, a lot of, a lot of coffee, a lot of coffee, uh, a very forgiving wife and son. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. I'm not sleeping as much as I should be probably. And actually I just told my wife, I was saying, you know, I'm, uh, I think I need to get more sleep. And so what I, what I've decided to do is really sort of, you know, try to get to bed early. Even if that means I wake up earlier, um, uh, that's fine. I don't know, Riaz, if you saw No Tech Sunday was not great because I actually had to get you guys some slides. So like 4 a.m., I don't know, something some between 4 and 6 a.m. I was up. It's funny how, you know, you get your bowl and you do this, right? So, oh, I guess I can't talk about that, but whatever. So I was up at 4 a.m., right? I did a little bit of what I'm supposed to do at 4 a.m. And then I got online and started finishing my presentation for, uh, for the crew today and sent it off. Um, so next, No Tech Sunday was a little bit of a caveat uh, this weekend, uh, but uh, but as a general matter, like it's 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 crazy, um, you know. I, I have the I I've been lucky. I've been able to get up and go back to sleep. And so if you have that skill set, like that, that's something you can take advantage of too. So, um, but um, not a lot of sleep. 
and a lot of coffee. <laughs> Um, so, so let's, we've got a few students. I, I think we probably have a little bit more time for some questions if you're still good with it, Jamil. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, so we're well, going to roll through them. Um, sure. but I, we want to be mindful of time. So just, just a few more questions. So get those last questions in, make sure you're reading each other's questions and upvote them so that we don't, you know, have the same question going on and on. Um, we've got a lot of college students, you know, they the, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but what type of majors is, is there a cybersecurity major? Uh, what do you recommend for a college student, uh, courses to take? Um, for, for a lot of, you know, again, a lot of our audience is asking similar questions about, about their path in, in college specifically. Yeah, look, I mean, obviously, as we said earlier, computer science is an obvious one. Uh, engineering uh, is an obvious one. Um, uh, but, uh, but beyond that, there are a lot of fields. There are cybersecurity degrees now, uh, both, uh, both uh, undergrad and graduate degrees. Um, I don't, I think it varies probably from institution to institution on how good those are, right? They're fairly new and sort of new degrees tend to be, um, tend to be a little different. I say that, by the way, as somebody who just started a new degree program at George Mason, we now have a master's in law in cybersecurity, intelligence and national security that we literally just created in the last in the last year and a half, which is super cool. So if you're a lawyer and want to do that, uh, we have a graduate program for you. Uh, but uh, but but again, I, I do think these newer these newer courses tend to be, you know, you got to look at them. So I would classic degree, cybersecurity, sorry, uh, computer science, engineering. Uh, beyond that, there's a ton of other things that are data science degrees and, art, and artificial intelligence, machine learning focused degrees. Um, and by the way, I do think graduate degrees are really important. Um, and I really do think that uh, people undercount the value of spending the time it takes to get a PhD, right? PhDs are so important, so valuable. People are scared of them because they take a long time. You've got to write this really long paper, but they can, that the reason they're so differentiating is because they're, they're hard, right? And so a lot of people think, oh, I'll just go, I'll get a law degree because I want to, you know, whatever. It's, I needed a graduate degree, right? Or I'll, I'll get a, a terminal master's degree, right? I'll be honest with you, most terminal master's degrees, at least in the social sciences, are not particularly valuable, right? What is valuable, like a master's in computer science or aeronautical engineering, there is some value in that, right? An MBA, certainly valuable, right? But, you know, most terminal master's degrees are not really sort of the kind of graduate school I'm talking about. You need a professional degree, an MBA, a JD, right? A PhD in a top-notch field or a master's in computer science or the like, right? Social sciences master's degrees, you know, they're all right. But if you're going to do that, really get serious and get a PhD. Love it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the companies uh, that, that are out there. Are there, yeah. are, are there some popular companies that, um, that, that you would suggest or that people should be looking at? Um, somebody asked if you're invested in any cybersecurity stocks. I, I don't know if we need to go, go down that path, but at least talk, yeah. talk to me about some of these companies um, that are big in the space. Well, so unfortunately, I spent so much time in the government, I don't have a ton of money to invest, right? Uh, although a lot of my time and money is invested in Ironet, right? Because we're you know, and we're going to ultimately go public. So hopefully that all works out well. Um, I can't really talk about that because we're bound by, by, by rules around that. Um, but look, um, I think that there are a lot of great companies out there today. Uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, all the big players, uh, Netflix, um, CarMax. Um, you know, there's a ton of uh, companies that are, that are both, that have physical presences and are cyber and online, right? And are both, right? Um, and so there's a ton of places you could go work. Almost every company um, has a need for folks in cybersecurity. Um, uh, but, you know, but then there's cyber, pure cybersecurity companies like I think we mentioned CrowdStrike earlier, uh, Tanium, uh, you know, IronNet, uh, Darktrace, Vectra, ExtraHop are some of our competitors. Um, you know, there are companies, um, in, you know, FireEye, Mandiant, uh, Telos. I mean, I, you know, you, you, you can go on forever. I mean, there's, there are so many companies that it's hard to name all of them. Um, Palo Alto Networks, right? I mean, there's a ton of great cyber companies, startups, and long-standing companies that are out there publicly in the markets today. Um, and there are, again, at least in the cybersecurity space, and I think more generally in the tech space, there are more jobs than humans to fill them. So if you're looking for a place with a lot of jobs, this is a place to come. Now, I cannot emphasize, do not go get a degree or take a job in a field because you're like, there's lots of jobs and it's big money. That is a terrible way to pick a job. By the way, it's the way most people pick jobs. Don't be that person. Find a job you care about and are passionate about. And unless it's a job which just doesn't pay a lot, which there are some of those, right? You're going to do well at that if you really care about it and are passionate about it. You will be successful. And, and it is okay to do the thing you care about and not the thing that looks like it's going to make a lot of money and the like. It is important to look at fields of the future, right? But find a future that you care about. I'm loving all the CarMax plugs. I, I didn't solicit any of this from you, but thank you for that. Uh, I'll take it <laughs> when I can. Um, there you go. So we've got some we've got some Jamathi members who you know 
they just love technology. They love playing with it. They, you know, they're just, they just know that there's something about technology that they like. Uh, they like understanding, you know, how it works. They, they feel like they're good at it, but they just are not sure what field that might be right for them. Um, is, do you have any advice on, on that? It, you know, maybe it's not particular cybersecurity, but it's just, you know, they, they just like being around technology and understanding how it works. Yeah, look, if you like being around technology and you're really interested in it, well, you should get a job in technology. Again, there's so many jobs in the space. It, why not? Why not do the thing that's fun for you, right? If you enjoy, you know, like playing with computers and messing with them and getting into them, right? That's probably a field you could be successful in, right? And you could even build a business in. Again, by the way, you don't need to go get a job at a company. You can start your own business, right? Some of the most successful entrepreneurs in our own community and in, in the larger technology community are people who start their own businesses, right? It is not easy. It is hard. It will take time. It will take more time than any job you've ever had, right? It will be taxing. You will fail multiple times along the way. You will be frustrated. You'll be angry, right? But it can be hugely lucrative and it can be hugely rewarding personally. And building a thing is pretty amazing, right? I built this think tank, right? At George Mason, right? There was, there was no there was no NSI, right? It was, it was five years ago, you know, my dean raised a bunch of money for the law school more generally. I said to him, hey, how about a little bit of money for, for this program that I run? And he's like, no, how about you write me a memo and, and, and start something up? I'm like, okay, so I wrote him a memo. He liked it. He's like, well, let's go raise some money. We went to talk to two donors. They gave us a good startup, bunch of money. And now we're running, you know, a 1.3, $1.4 million budget. We're not a, we're not a large thing. Take, we're small, right? We have six full-time employees, but we're doing cool stuff, right? And, uh, you know, it doesn't happen unless you do it, right? You just got to sort of step off the ledge. Absolutely. Now, what if someone was interested more on the hardware side? Are there any opportunities in cybersecurity if you're interested in, in hardware? Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, you know, all these data centers that are being built for Amazon and, and, you know, people talk about the end of the data center, right? It's not the end of the data center, it's just a different data center, right? Um, high performance computing is critical, right? Being able to, to, to deploy the edge computing of the future, the cloud computing of the future, uh, even with 5G networks, the, the, the way this works is it, are the chips uh, and the motherboards on which they run and the systems in which they run and all the hardware around them. That's the only way they work. And whether that's in quantum or classic computing, there's a ton of hard work to be done, right? Hardware is not going away. It might be getting smaller and faster and cheaper and easier to use. But at the end of the day, all these computations that we talk about, it all runs on a hardware device. And that hardware device has its own vulnerabilities and needs to be made secure, right? You can't, you can't just say, well, if it's a data center, it's going to be safe. It's locked up in behind a, behind, a, behind a fence, right? You need to make sure that, that that hardware and the software that runs on top of it is secure. And so there's a ton of opportunities in hardware more generally, but also in hardware security for sure. So we have some Jamaati members who are also, um, they're, they're uh, majoring in cybersecurity already. And so they're taking classes right now. And they're wondering, should they go for their comp TIA security plus? Um, should, they, should they go for that next, that next level? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, if you look at the certificate, and again, like, I, I'm just basing this on statistics that I found on the internet, right? So <laughs> your mileage may vary. Uh, I recently saw an Abraham Lincoln quote said that the thing, about, the thing about quotes on the internet is, you know, you never know if they're real. Of course, it, Abraham Lincoln wasn't alive, so he couldn't have said that, right? Um, but the point is like, so based on the statistics that I found, if they're accurate, right? It looks like there's an, over, an oversupply of people with CompTIA certifications and an undersupply of jobs relative to the number of people that have it. But on the CISSP and other ones on, on the bottom half of that chart you saw, there is an undersupply of job. Uh, there's an oversupply of jobs, undersupply of certified people. So you might want to look at that chart again. I can't speak to whether that chart is accurate, but if it is accurate, uh, that may be a guide. Um, I know CompT is a great certification to have, um, so I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying maybe maybe look at the charts and see what makes the most sense for you in, in the field you want to pursue. So, from an educational perspective, if you're getting into cybersecurity, would you prefer would you advise someone to take the networking path or more like software development? I'd advise people to do what they're interested in, right? Because if you're really, I mean, look, it's a different skill set, right? People who are good coders are not going to be good network architects. They're just not, they're not the same skill set. And yeah, maybe some people could be good at both, right? But you probably know what you like. Go do that, right? Don't, like, again, I can't, I, I can't tell you how many times, and by the way, it's not just an Ismaili thing. It's not just a young people thing. I have this conversation with people who have excelled the highest levels, have been, have been in the C-suite at companies, have been in the most senior levels of government, um, and also high school students and college students, right? It's the same conversation. Oh, I really want to go do this thing because it pays a lot of money, or because there's a lot of jobs available, or you know, the thing that I did before is like this thing, so I want to go do that, right? Those are bad reasons to take a job or pursue a career. Good reasons are 
that's a really interesting area for me and I really care about it. I really wanna go excel at that. That's a good reason. And you will, by the way, excel at that if you do it. If you just go take that job, oh, I'm gonna go be, I'm gonna go take a coding path because it's more lucrative or there are more jobs, right? That's a terrible way to pick a career. Most people do it that way, but it's not the right way, in my view. Would you say coding is necessary uh, to get into cybersecurity? Understanding coding? No. I couldn't code my way out of Vox. Now, having a basic familiarity with, you know, what JavaScript is, is great. But like, no, I couldn't. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, my son can code better than I can. He's 11. He can also play chess better than I can. So that might explain it. Um, what so what kind of personality would you recommend or, or um, aptitude interest for someone getting into cybersecurity? Well, look, I, you know, cybersecurity is takes all kinds, right? Um, it takes it takes introverts, it takes extroverts, right? You need extroverts to sell the software, <coughs> pardon me, and, and at some level create the the companies um, and and make the companies excel. Uh, you need introverts to 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 figure out the coding and 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 make it work. And by the way, there are some coders who are real extroverts. There are some CEOs who are real introverts, right? So it's not a one to one, um, but it takes all kinds, right? You, there's not a particular sort of mindset. If you're interested in it. You can do it. You just have to want to do it and get past your own hangups, right? You got to be willing to put yourself out there and press forward and know that you will succeed. And so I think that's perhaps the most important thing, much more important than figuring out, well, does this feel take introverts or extroverts? It takes both. So it's really interesting. Like you talked about your career path earlier, you know, you, you, you got your law degree. How did you leverage that law degree to kind of get into where you're at now? That's funny, actually, in some ways, my law degree has been a stumbling block, right? Because everyone wants to think about me as a lawyer, right? right? They're like, oh, well, you're a lawyer, so you, or, oh, you did policy, so you want to be a policy person. I'm like, no, I'm doing business now, so I've been for the last six years. That's who I am, right? But they look at my resume, and they're like, well, but you're a lawyer. And I, so I constantly describe myself. If you look at my Twitter bio, it says I'm a recovering lawyer, because it's true. I'm a recovering lawyer. I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not currently practicing. I'm probably not going to practice for a long time. Um, and uh, so, you know. Um, uh, it, but at the same time, right, I leveraged my legal skills. I love being a lawyer, right? By the way, I loved law school. It was, it was the best. It was the best. I had a great time. Uh, and I highly recommend it for anybody who's into that and wants to do that. It's, it's an awesome field. Um, but I use my legal skills every day in sales calls, talking to our marketing people, talking to our technology people. I use those skills every day um, and they're highly valuable. But yeah, I mean, I, in a lot of ways, it, 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 is, it is a challenge because, you know, I'm down this path that's sort of weird and different for somebody who wants to be a cybersecurity business leader. Don't worry, Jamil. I'm not offended uh, when you're dancing no, no. around the the law school. I love, there. I, love I, I love law school. I was it was the most fun I had. I love being a lawyer, right? I ultimately decided I don't want to be a, a working lawyer for the rest of my career, right? That's okay. You can make that choice, right? But like, you know, it doesn't mean that I didn't love it when I was doing it. And look, I loved it so much. I still teach it, right? So clearly, I don't. I'm not. I'm not one of those lawyers who's a self-hating lawyer, right? Like, I love it enough to go teach young people at law school. So. I'd be interested to see what kind of what kind of team professor you are. You know, are you the guy that makes you stand up and read the facts of the case? Or I'll, you know? I'll, I'll, I do. I teach. I teach Socratic. I'll tell it really quick though. So I got a, I got one of my first teaching evaluations back. You know, a decade ago when I started teaching, and I read it. I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I went. I took it to work. I read it to my friends at work. Right. And I'm like, listen to what the students said about you. Know, you write you write notes on the back of your emails. By the way, your professor read those, so write them. Right. So I read it. I read a line, and what it said was. Taking class with Professor Jaffer is like standing on the beach during a tidal wave. You're just getting, getting, keep getting hit by waves and waves of inflation. And I'm like, yes, this is awesome. And my coworkers were like, no, no, that's a criticism. You, they don't, nobody wants that. I'm like, no, everybody wants that. That's great, right? It's a lot of information. And they're like, man, they just shook their heads. And I never really have learned, as you can tell from today, I apparently did not learn that lesson. So what can you do? Those are the ones you remember the most though, for sure. Yeah. Um, so... Someone asked, were you part of making the uh, Patriot Act bill? Uh, I was not, in that at all? I was not uh, but I was involved in the reauthorization of the Patriot Act uh, in 2005 when I was at the Justice Department. So the original bill was passed in 2001. I was still in law school at the time, uh, but I did have a hand in the reauthorization and I did have a, a hand in, in all those surveillance programs that came out of the Patriot Act, right? So for example, the 215 metadata program that was revealed by Edward Snowden, the 702, um, I, did, I was involved in the creation of the 702 program. That's the, that's the um, uh, the the surveillance in the United States of foreigners located overseas, uh, as well as a whole bunch of uh, litigation cases involving the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act before that classified court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and and the Court of Review. So it's been it's been a, again. So being a lawyer was a lot of fun for me. I got to work in like crazy cool environments. I got to travel all around the world. I mean, I went to all. I mean, you name a place where Al Qaeda operated, and I probably visited it. Um, 
you know, over the course of my time at the House Sales Committee, the Senate, the Department of Justice, it was it was amazing. All over Africa, all over all over Southeast Asia, all over the Middle East. Um, I mean, God, I went to go with Senator Corker. I got to sit in a room with Jaime Karzai and and watch them like yell at each other. It was the craziest thing. It was uh, the head of the ISI uh, in Pakistan. We sat down with him, um, um, uh, uh, Kayani. I mean, it was. I, mean, I wasn't doing the talking to be clear. I was the staffer in the back, right? But it was still super cool. You were the fly on the wall that was exactly. watching all this exactly. unfold. That's right. No, that's right. Or the fly in pens is here. Um, that's right. <laughs> like uh, that. So, so all this global global connectivity today, right? Um, would it be fair to say, and this is a question from a Jamaat member, um, that the underlying cause of cyber risk is this global connectivity? Um, would self-contained networks be mm. safer? So this is a really interesting question because there's a lot of talk about maybe we build, you know, the Chinese have the, the great firewall, right? Iran has a similar capability. Um, and maybe we ought to just wall off our networks and be safe, right? But look, the, the reality is, A, um, this global connectivity has created massive productivity changes. It's brought uh, amazing opportunities to parts of the world that, that didn't have access to. It's brought, it's brought skills and knowledge, democracy, you know, freedom uh, to places where, where it was suppressed before. Um, so I think the, the global connectivity has been a huge boon, right? And, and, and retreating away from it uh, is a mistake. It's like, but also trying to retreat away from it is, is unlikely to be successful, right? We talk all the time about, um, you know, firewall networks or, or air-gapped networks, right? Our, our OT networks, our operational technology networks that, that, that make cars or, or produce power or whatever, that they're walled off from the internet. They're, they're air-gapped. They're not, they don't touch the internet. Reality is, there's never been a significant air gap that you couldn't cross or that frankly, that wasn't actually an air gap, right? When you think you've air gapped or you're disconnected, you oftentimes aren't. Um, and just look at the case of what the, the alleged activities the US government got involved in with Iran and the Stuxnet virus, right? Here was a, a, a theoretically a facility that was sort of off the grid, right? A covert facility. Um, and it, it, if stories are to be believed, either the Americans or the Israelis or them working together, uh, were able to get a capability in there that caused the centrifuges to spin really fast and break down. Um, and again, whether that story is true or not, it tells an interesting story about even what you think is your most protected air gap walled off network, there's always an access capability. And by the way, you know, it's an important thing for cybersecurity professionals to know, right? You may think you've got this great protection, right? But people are creative. And the, the more you lock your network down, the more likely they are to try and seek a way to evade it, right? You just think about your own yourself and you're trying to get on your corporate network and it doesn't work. You find a way around it oftentimes to get your work done, right? And, uh, and it may not be the best way, it may be very insecure, sometimes really locking down security actually makes you less safe because people are creative and they find a way around it that's actually less secure. Well, let's do this. Uh, th I guess this will be the last question. And, um, you know, for people who didn't get their questions answered, obviously, you know, Jamil, we're going to put up your, uh, we're going to put up your information again, right at the end. So sure. uh, after this, but, you know, seeing that this, this is about fields of the future, can you tell us a little bit about where you see cybersecurity going? Let's say five years down the line, ten years down the line, in the immediate in the immediate future. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I could predict that, I'd be I'd be a billionaire, right? Um, if I could see where where the future of cybersecurity was, I'd go build that company and, and take advantage of it. Um, but look, I think that uh, the problem is not likely to get dramatically better, right? Um, are the adversaries, right? Whether they're nation states or criminal hacker gangs or individuals, hacktivists, and the like, uh, they're getting better. And the offense, as with as with most sports. Uh, and 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 activities. Offense is always going to win, right? And the defense can barely can just keep can do its best to keep up. And cybersecurity professionals are getting better, and they are keeping up, and they are getting better, right? They've cut that time to breach detection from over 100 days just a few years ago now down to 56. It's still too many. Um, but the problem is likely to get worse uh, before it gets better. Um, and so I think there's going to remain a lot of opportunities. What it's going to look like in five, 10 years from now, man, if I can predict that. Whew. We'd have we'd all be we'd all be rich, uh, but uh, but unfortunately I can't. Uh, but I can tell you I think it, that cybersecurity um, and global connectivity and the like are around to stay um, and likely to deepen and expand over time. Particularly as we see five G deployed more widely and broadly, um, and as more connections and economic relationships and, and and political and social relations are built up across the globe. I mean, you could talk to your family on video anywhere in the world for almost for free for hours on end. I mean, that just wasn't possible in our parents' generation. Um, and, and you just think about what it's gonna be for our children and their generation, it's gonna be, it can be, it, it's an amazing world. I mean, I just recently got the Oculus, right, by the way, if you haven't seen this thing, it is amazing. I'm not trying to pitch for Facebook or anything, but I'm telling you, like what they do in VR now is crazy, right? I thought it was way too expensive. I've got it for me as a gift, right? So it may allow me to pretend like I didn't spend the money on it, but you gotta try this thing out. If you have a friend that has it, it is so cool. It just thinks about, you just think about what it means for the future though, interacting with, um, with other environments, other people, 
in a virtual environment could be really cool. Um, so I would check that out if I were if I were in your shoes. All right, Jamil, thank you so much. Uh, with that, we're out of time for questions. Um, again, we're going to put up Jamil's contact info. Um, and Jamil, do you have any you know parting words or or anything that you want to say to the audience before we let you go? No, I mean, I, all I would say is, look, the fact of the matter is I am living proof that you can do it too, right? Like I grew up just like you did, I'm a, children of immigrants from, from East Africa, right? Muslim immigrants in, here in the United States, right? First generation here, um, you know, I, I wasn't a cybersecurity person growing up other than I had this technology thing that my dad gave me, right? Um, it is, it, is a, it is a doable thing. You can work in the White House. You can work for members of Congress. You can go to Pakistan and India and, 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 and East Africa and, and, and North Africa and travel with senators and Congress. Like, it is a doable thing, right? It is not hard. It's not impossible. Parents, your kids can do it. Let them do it, right? Give them the chance to go do something crazy. My dad was not thrilled when I said, I'm not going to go straight to law school. I'm going to take time off. I ended up taking the time off. I went back to law school. It worked out. It was fine. It took a little while to get over it, but it worked. So let your kids do it. Kids, go do it. Run at it. Take risks. Smart, intelligent risks. Get a great education. Go to a top-notch institution. That's all I got. Thank you so much, Jamil. That was a real treat for, for the Jamaat and for the audience. Um, I, I know that we learned a ton today from you. So thank you for your expertise and your time. Thanks for having me, Ras. All right. Thank you all for attending today. I want to remind you all of this last slide uh, to stay home and save lives. Um, our institutions encourage, encourage you to stay home uh, and continue practicing uh, social distancing. So for our, our evaluation uh, slide, I think we're going to put that up there. Let's see. One second. OK. So please complete the brief evaluation, fieldsofthefuture.com slash feedback. Um, you know, before we conclude, please, please co complete this feedback for us so we can let us know how to improve our upcoming events. The link on your screen are, along with the QR code. Uh, additionally, for easier access, we've shared the link in the chat box. So please take a moment, complete it. Once again, thank you all for attending. Uh, you know, we hope to see you at our event in two weeks with Raheem Bojani from, and he's going to be talking about exploring data visualization. So thank you. Yeah, I'm the.